Hey everyone and welcome back to the Contemplative Science Podcast. My name is Jamie and this week I'm lucky enough to be talking to my co-host Dr Mark Miller on some new research he's working on. Mark, how are you man? Howdy, howdy. Well, listen, you started off by saying some research I'm working on and um, that we just have to appreciate that it's still quite nascent. So what we're going to do today, I hope, is get super jazzed up uh, about some stuff that's in the works. Um, And it's a topic that I'm extremely passionate about, um, that I really believe in. Um, And uh, finally, it looks like we have the sort of pieces coming together where we might be able to do something a little bit more um, rigorous to um, check in and see if it's right and what the values will be. Yeah, awesome. So let's jump straight in. Um, We talk on this podcast quite often about danger and uncertainty. And the usual story we tell is brain doesn't like uncertainty. Brain doesn't like danger. And the initial response is to go something like, sweet, so we need less of it. Yeah, but right. You're going, to tell, you're going to tell me today that's not fully the story. Yeah, it's nice. Good. Okay. So just before we jump forward, um, I know our listeners probably um, feel like they have like a, a degree by contact for thinking about anticipatory dynamics because that sort of pops up a lot. It's my research. And so it's sort of always um, filtering through when I'm talking about these topics that we talk about. But just that first point you said, like where um, we don't like uncertainty or the brain doesn't like uncertainty. And just to push that just the one step farther, um, if our sort of new developments in computational cognitive neuroscience are right, um, the brain just is built to manage uncertainty and potentially to reduce that uncertainty. So that might ju- it might not only be a sort of proclivity, you know, it's not just that we're biased towards more certain environments, but rather you are built, you are of the you are of the nature of uh, uncertainty reduction. That's what you're built for. Um, and uh, so then it's an easy next step to say, well, if that's the case, then um, it should be the case that we're constantly avoiding uncertainty we're constantly avoiding um uncomfortability we're trying to find a perfectly good um fit with the environment a perfectly good grip with the environment um and yet that doesn't look like it's always the case right we tend towards we tend towards lots of things that don't look like they're very certain and we're usually um, they can be very exciting things well the interesting thing is like roller coasters or horror movies right are things that no no moving to mars like push the limit right moving to mars <laughs> is the big one um, I teach this quite a lot and when I'm in classes of young people and I say, uh, I get to this point to say, look, you're an uncertainty, potentially the case is that you're an uncertainty minimizing machine. That's just what you are. That's what a life form is actually. And then the next thing is, well, how does an uncertainty minimizing machine like us manage the kinds of environments that we're in? Um, how does it actually reduce uncertainty in the environment? That's a complex story. Um, but I always push back with this puzzle. Like then it looks like we should try to always be reducing uncertainty. And yet we tend towards lots of uncertainty. And I say, well, look, give me a show of hands who here, if given the chance would go colonize Mars. And I've never had a room where not one person put up their hands with, uh, you know, quite a bit of gusto. Um, and in my most recent, uh, um, class that I taught this, uh, 30% of the class, put their hands up and said they were determined that if there was a chance for them to be the first colonist, the Mars, that's maximally uncertain. That's a different planet, different food, different. I mean, that's different. Everything. Um, that's is probably as, as wildly uncertain as we could possibly get. And yet lots of people are jazzed up about it. Right. So that's on the extreme end. And then as you go down the gradation, you get 75% of people like roller coasters or horror movies or whatever movies. Yeah. Or even, you know, it's funny because just on the uncertainty model, the perfect holiday should be lying on the beach. But people want to do adventures and they want to just, even in that subtle way, take on that uncertainty. So the question I have for you is, how do you square the circle between people's lived evidence of wanting uncertainty and this idea that the brain is not only a proclivity to reducing uncertainty, but might be built that way as well? Good. So here's the, here's the, magic, here's the magic ingredient. Um, we have a temporally long uh, model of how things work in the world. Okay, so that just means we care not only about making it work right now, but about making it work in the long run, of course. It's one of the things that we're good at. So, you know, mind-wandering forward and mind-wandering backwards, 
even, you know, in the contemplative traditions, maybe we can come back to this as well, which I think is so interesting. In the contemplative tradition, it can sound like we're supposed to curtail those dynamics. But in fact, it's those dynamics that actually make us um, really adaptive to the kind of niche we're in. We are long-term prediction machines. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce uncertainty over our whole lifetime. And it turns out that if you want to be really good at reducing uncertainty over a long period of time, it behooves you to hang out with a good amount of uncertainty right now for a couple of reasons. One, because if you hang out in uncertainty, you are going to tend to be growing new skills and developing new abilities because you're hanging out in situations you're not used to. So if you're hanging out in things you're not used to, you're growing. And it turns out that the kind of thing that's good at reducing uncertainty over a long time is the kind of system that grows and develops and builds new skills and new abilities and finds new ways of relating to the environment. So in other words, if you really are optimizing for quote unquote certainty, you actually need to have your dose of uncertainty. It's like yeah. in the same in the same way, you know, parents, I don't know if this is right or not, but they have this idea that you like let kids get a little like get in the mud and get a bit ill and because it actually help builds them up in the long run. That's good. Right. So the one is and then that's a that's a great that's a perfect example. The, so the one is is that when you hang out in places you're not completely familiar with, you develop more skills and abilities. Now, over the long run, you're going to encounter a bunch of uncertainty you don't know what to do with. And human agents that have lots of skills and abilities turn out to be the ones that are going to be best set up to manage those kinds of black swan uncertainty situations when they come. So for instance, during COVID, you know, there was some fear about there being a break in the food chain. Um, and the humans who fared best in that sort of sudden and unexpected uncertainty were the ones who knew a little bit about gardening, knew a little bit about cultivation of food, knew a little bit about cooking, knew a little bit about community resourcing. I mean, if you have a couple of those things in play, you are a more resilient system when you meet an uncertain kind of uncertainty. Okay, so that's just one though. Let me give you the other one. So one is, if you hang out on certain things, you build some skills. The other thing that happens is, is if you hang out in a little bit of uncertainty, is you are also checking a little bit to see whether or not the things that you are taking currently to be certain are actually as best, that's the best view or the best belief network that you could have in play. So if you, <laughs> so think, you're trying to predict how the world is, that's what the brain is set up to do potentially, okay? And it, to do that, it has to, it has to start making some predictions about how it works. And we can have better and worse predictions. And if you get stuck in a bad prediction, like in a bad vector state um, for over long, then the system tends towards suboptimality. So depression might be like that. Like you get stuck in a belief network that says, uh, I'm not good enough, right? And even though you're getting counter evidence where you are making it work or you are good enough, um, that belief is so powerful. It's so ensconced that it actually turns the volume down on all the counter evidence and really it turns the volume up on all the evidence that that fits with it so what a good predictive system will have is it will occasionally blow up its own belief networks to some degree to check to see are there other kinds of believing that are actually better for me so you know get stuck in a flat earther realm um it would behoove you to occasionally push against that belief network to see whether or not there is actually a better collection of beliefs that are more adaptive. But that requires you to actually move through, you know, you have to actually move through uncertainty in order for that to happen. Right? Right. So in other words, the most effective way to really get you certainty is to just check in and make sure that the current set of beliefs that are providing stability are right. Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like before you anchor down, or every week with the anchor down, you just go have a little bit of a look under the boat. Yeah, and because it's a moving target, because as you build new skills and abilities, you're better able to adapt, then you're always gonna want a little bit of this like tolerance of uncertainty. And that's sort of the big thing that we're starting to we're starting to look at in relationship to well being. So maybe we can we can pull it back to the contemplative training here. Is there's a real space and a real value for um, finding 
healthy uncertainty to get involved with and to start generating some tolerance of uncertainty. So an uncertainty minimizing system actually works really well if you build up a little bit of its uncertainty tolerance. Um, so if you're stuck in a bad belief network, uh, let's say flat earthing, and um, one of the things that might prevent you from bumping out of that and uh, getting a better set of beliefs is that you just don't want to face the uncertainty of losing your community or of changing your belief sets or of reading new things. That's all a little bit, un that's going to be uncertain. You're not going to know how it's going to go. You're not going to, you're not sure who you'll be next. And if you have a really high intolerance to uncertainty, that might just be enough to keep you um, curtailed in that bad belief network, even if it's not serving you, even if it's producing suboptimal outcomes. The other, the other tension here, I guess, is when you're thinking about the contemplative path, you hear people talk about adventures, going into the unknown, knowing myself better. And what they're really saying is, hey, there's this kind of domestic, everyday kind of certainty. And there's something about it that makes me want to rip it up and go see what else is going on. Yeah, nice. So, in that, you're going against the grain, but nonetheless, while you're doing so, you have some vague sense that it's actually making you more secure. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so um, one of the ways one of the ways that we can use a meditation program, and really any meditation program, I think, does this to some degree, is we can use it to just like you say, um, become uh, uh, more welcoming of investigating our own beliefs and more welcoming of the opportunities to have those beliefs be changed, especially in favor of better beliefs. And in a good meditation program, it's set up um, sequentially and progressively so that you can test along the way if this kind of, um, you know, updating of your beliefs is useful or not. So for instance, you do, um, an empathic joy from the Buddhist tradition is such a good example here. Okay. So empathic in an empathic joy practice, you look at other people's successes, um, especially their spiritual successes. Like you see people really making their practice work or developing virtue or, um, you know, coming to find refuge in, um, in, uh, a different sort of way of relating to the world. And then the whole, the whole play in the practice is you feel good about their success, okay? And now this is, meant to, this is meant to counteract all the sort of jealousy stuff that we get in the world normally where we look at and we go comparing mind stuff, you know, oh, they have that and I don't have that. And so your successes burn me up. You're trying to flip that, right? So there's an example where you have a belief and the belief, the sort of latent er belief is if other people are succeeding, uh, faster than me, then that should signal a security system to up my cortisol and adrenaline stressors because I'm obviously not doing well enough. Um, the sort of zero sum mentality, like your success, uh, also equals me not succeeding. And you're trying to update that belief system because for lots of things, that's not the case, you know, or we're comparing things that don't matter. You know, you look at somebody who has great hair and you're like, oh my goodness, they have great hair. And you're like, actually, maybe you should update that because who cares, <laughs> who cares who has good hair? Okay, no, so no, that's, no. Well, there's one thing. So when you update that, when you can update that belief a little and you can start getting into like, no, it's cool for other people to succeed in, especially in non-zero sum activities where everybody can have more. Um, it's cool to have other people succeed. And I actually feel good when you succeed then you can test that along the way and see, actually, no, I'm, I'm better now because I've updated my belief about how other people's successes relate to me. And that can come drips and drabs. So you're not doing something radical. You're changing things on the way and then you're seeing the positive feedback that comes. All, all you need, all you need is, is that the system is really good at monitoring how efficiently it's managing volatility in the environment and um, updating your beliefs in some of these ways will signal to the system massive updates in efficiency. So for instance, if every time I look out into the world and I see somebody who is thinner or stronger or taller than me, I feel bad. Okay. So, so my status quo 
at the beginning of the program is that I have a lot of comparing mind stuff and I'm getting a lot of error signals every time I look out into the world where I see somebody else who's, let's say, just, you know, has these sort of superficial features that are different than mine. Okay. And then think about the update that happens. If you could change around the belief networks through a progressive training program, such that when you see other people succeeding in the world, when you see them having qualities or characteristics that we suspect make their lives feel nice, make them feel good about themselves, especially spiritual qualities where now they're like really getting the right relationship with their life and with their suffering and with their happiness, then we feel good about that rather than bad. That is a massive update in the amount of error that we're having to manage. We don't have all of those little comparing errors anymore. Rather, looking out and seeing people succeed is giving us, is giving us signals that things are really going well in the world rather than things are going poorly. Um, that is, I mean, that is exactly the kind of thing our system should uh, sort of evolve to really um, perk up and pay attention to because that's, that's, a single, that's a single kind of change. That belief network gets jostled a bit and you have an invariant change. You have a change across your invariant structures, meaning you have what looks like one belief update actually manages a ton of different kinds of errors. All of the errors of comparing might get quieted or suffused just by updating one particular style of relating. That's huge. That's very, that's very economical for our brain. Change one thing, fix lots of things. That's the thing that should bring a lot of peace and a lot of like magnetism to our kind of system. And it's also true to like, you know, you run into the same beliefs in every area of your life. Like, I don't know if you've had this experience where you're like out for a drink with someone or then you're in work the next day. And it's like two different like negative emotions, you think, but then you stop and think about it. And it's like, oh, it's, it's coming from the same. Yeah, but we're not very creative. We only have so many good things and so many bad things. And so, um, I mean, that's really what the genius of a lot of these contemplative programs is. I mean, they've been built over a long time and they're useful for a large, a large cut of the population probably. And that's because they really get down to some of the essential, the essential little belief networks that might be causing some of the problems. But I want to just, I want to just task switch here to something that I think is a little bit more radical and I think more interesting also. Um, we talk a lot in the contemplative science community about um, the meditative process process and usually what we mean is attention training or the relationship between attention and awareness um that's mostly what we're talking about like love and kindness is starting to come in a little bit at the edge um but mostly we're looking at process and not content by and large when you look at meditative papers they're not talking about what are they meditating on they're talking about how they're going about doing meditation and this is something that I'm really interested in is starting to think about what are some of the benefits of meditating on particular contents. And um, the program that I am just starting now um, with some wonderful people at Aarhus University um, at the Recreational Fear Lab, we've just had a sort of initiation talk um, just a couple of days ago, and I'm hoping it's going to grow into something, is we want to look at the benefits of meditating on really challenging, really uncertain content. So... What happens when we meditate on contents related to illness, injury, uh, old age, death? Because we have um, lots of the contemplative training programs, not just Buddhist, although Buddhist is a nice one to sort of grab from, but loads have this, um, have this traditional wisdom that it can, or even the Stoics, right, have this traditional wisdom that it's really valuable to reflect and to hang out with really uncomfortable um, imaginative data. I mean, even so far as you have, you have guidance in the Buddhist tradition to meditate on the hell realms. Um, Michael Taft, I remember during COVID, I attended one of his um, meditation nights and he was having us meditate on the COVID hell. So in that meditation, we're like deep in COVID. Okay. Imagine we're all not feeling very good because we're having a ton of undigestible uncertainty to manage. Okay. And Michael's having us reflect on, um, I want you to imagine people suffocating from COVID in all directions for as far as you can see. Like, we want to hang out there. 
And you think like, why the hell would, why the hell would, I'm already under a massive amount of duress. I'm already managing too much uncertainty. Why then would it be valuable, potentially valuable to like push the envelope and really sit with probably the, you know, the hottest button topic you can imagine. Why would that be valuable? And yet we have long traditions like this meditations on Jesus going to the cross meditations on the crucifixion itself in all of its grueling nature has been proposed by the Christian contemplatives for a really long time as part of their mental health program, as part of their spiritual health program. Um, in Buddhism, you reflect on the decaying body regularly. You reflect on injuries regularly. You reflect on all the ways that humans can miss the mark regularly. Um, and yet when we put, for instance, Buddhist monastics in the scanner, they hit all the marks for a, a really healthy, optimizing and happy brain. Why is that the case? Why would it be the case that meditating on super challenging stuff actually makes us better? Um, and I think that's a very interesting research program. There's one that I'm, I'm just about to jump into. And what ends up being the answer? Like, yeah, well, I don't know. Like, 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 I've got some, you know, we've got some, we've got some, if you start from, if you start from this idea that we've just started today's episode with about thinking about the brain as an anticipatory machine and then take the next step saying, well, you might assume the best thing for that machine is to reduce all uncertainty. And actually that turns out to be wrong. We have lots of reasons to believe that the right amounts of uncertainty helps that system be well. Um, then you just push the envelope a little bit further. What we want to look at is um, what sorts of uncertainties in particular are the ones that are going to be sort of maximally valuable for us to be healthy in the ways uh, that we'd like to be. And there are some surprising, some, well, potentially surprising outcomes. This is built a little bit on the back of some work we've been doing with horror movies. Um, I love this research. I think it's provocative and sexy in all the right ways. You know, like where your tendency is to think, well, horror, the horror genre is a little bit of a, a guilty, a guilty pleasure. You know, it's really not doing any good for you. It's something you sort of do and you scare yourself a bit. And that's sort of fun to sort of scare yourself a bit in a sort of safe environment. And yet, and yet there's um, a growing literature that suggests that there's a bunch of health benefits that can come from this. Now that's not for everybody. Um, some personality types are not going to be benefited and some attractions to horror are not going to be wholesome. Um, but there is a big cut where hanging out with horrible content, like being chased by, you know, terrifying supernatural monsters actually has some really interesting bang on health effects for the mind. Um, a big part of that, well, the two that I think are kind of interesting are one, you're closing the informational gap about predators. I think that's kind of interesting just as a low grade start. So why might we be attracted to horror? That's sort of where we're transitioning here, right? Why, we, why might we like to go to horror movies if we're uncertainty minimizing brains? Um, one reason is, is because we're trying to get information about things that might matter to us. And like predators chasing us was evolutionarily valuable stuff. So there might still be mechanisms in us that want to know uh, what's it like to be in a terrible situation like that. So during the, during the pandemic, um, we had like this huge jump in horror movie sales, like um, horror movie production and sales went up to 40%, which is the highest it's ever been. You would expect during COVID, we probably should have turned to comedies, but we didn't. We turned to horror. And not only that, but we turned to pandemic horror film and TV shows. Uh, part of the reason I suspect is because an uncertainty minimizing system is always trying to figure out how it is in the world so that it can reduce the uncertainty. And so we're looking for information. We're looking to close the informational gap over this thing that's potentially dangerous. That's part of it. Yeah. That's fascinating though, because it's we're basically saying the fun of watching a co uh, like I don't know, like um Contagion. Like, conta thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like Contagion or like um one of those in a pandemic is you end up being like on the level of your brain somehow feeling more prepared. 
Yeah, that's right. Exactly. You feel prepared. You feel weirdly prepared. You might think, well, it's just a fiction. And you're like, yeah, but the, the brain might not really know that. It's just looking for evidence. It's just looking for, well, how does things work? And what do people do in these sorts of situations? That's what movies are. Movies are situations plus how people respond. And that's good data for us. Even if it's a little bit fictionalized, it's good data for our kind of system to work out. Well, what, what might it be like if this happens like this? Okay. Which is which is hysterical because when you think these movies through, part of the fun. Well, it depends though because you know the scarier and the better the horror, the more realistic. So there's two big reasons I think why we like horror. Well, there's lots of reasons probably, but I want to just showcase two here because then they go back to the contemplative training programs. I think nicely. One is you're closing the informational gap. We might be interested in safe, scary experiences because there's information there about things that matter to us and we're attracted to it and we feel good about being there because we're figuring something out about the world. That's part of it. So why did, why are we fascinated by true crime podcasts right now? Well, it does actually give you a lot of information. It tells you, well, what do psychopaths do in certain situations? And we have an evolutionary buy-in to know what kinds of predators work in our world and how they work. And so no wonder we get drawn to it. We're, we're closing the informational gap in some way. Okay, the other thing we're doing, now this one is not as obvious, but I think it's probably the more important one. We are, just by being in the safe, scary event, we are learning about our own reactions to um, scary data. That's, that's crucial. For a system uh, who is set on figuring out how the world works and how you work relative to the world, all of that's being used to make good predictions. A central component of that is figuring out how you respond when you encounter certain things. And you want good data about that. You want to know what it's like to respond to certain things. That's going to help you optimize your responses. And you can only, this is the magic bit, you can only get good evidence about how you behave in scary situations if you repeatedly put yourself in scary situations and let the system garner the evidence from that, from that experience. So you have to be in the experience long enough that the system figures out like, oh, that's what adrenaline cascades are like when we're under duress. And the more that it knows about its own scary reactivity the better able it is to manage that reactivity. I'll just give you one quick example, okay? So uh, if anybody here has had like anxiety about like public speaking or something, um, that can really stop people from doing public speaking. But if you public speak enough and you really watch how anxiety rolls, for most people what happens is you have a spike of anxiety and it doesn't last. It can't last actually because those those... Uh, adrenaline systems they're not they're not persistent and consistent they're they're intermittent and, and, and temporary okay so what you end up having is you have a lot of anxiety and then more or less as soon as you start talking it subsides because the system moves on to something else so you have this natural arc of anxiety okay if you didn't know that like if you don't deep down know that then when you start to feel the rise of anxiety that can bump you off of the task so you call in sick you go to have a drink instead. Um, you know, you do something else rather than go to this talk that you've now had set up. But if you know, like let's say you do 50 talks and you know that every single talk, there's this rise and fall in adrenaline, pretty soon the system is going to start reinterpreting the rise of anxiety. It now predicts the rise and fall of anxiety accurately. And so the rise of that uncertainty is no longer newsworthy uncertainty. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get uncomfortable when I'm going to talk, but it always goes away. It always goes away as soon as I get into it. And so it's not something that needs to be directing my behaviors. It's now, it's now expected uncertainty. It's certain uncertainty rather than feel? uncertain uncertainty. And how does that feel in the body relative to unexpected uncertainty? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you from my own experience, because I always feel uncomfortable before I'm going to give a pro talk, but I give them all the time sure. now. Um, originally, it was unbearable anxiety. The first 
professional talk I gave, I stood in front of the auditorium and I went up to the microphone. This is an academic talk, okay? I went up to the microphone and I tapped it with my finger and I said, uh, hi, uh, my name is um, Mark Miller. I'm gonna be giving this talk and I just wanna make sure everybody knows this is my first talk like this and if I faint, then I'd like you to tell the EMS that I'm allergic to penicillin. And everybody laughed and then I got into it and actually the laugh helped. But that, that's how scared I was, is I had to roll it into a comedy routine in order to get through it. Um, I still have the same, probably, arousal activations, but I don't notice them unless you ask me to notice them. If just before a talk, you were to ask me, do you have any uncomfortable feelings right now related to anxiety for speaking? And I checked in. I would have said yes. Yes, there, of course, I have like some butterflies or something. But if you hadn't have asked me, I'd probably overlook it. So the difference, therefore, between uncertainty your system is not expecting is you feel every bump in the road. Anxiety your system is expecting is there but less detectable. That's right. Because it's, because it's expect so at some level of the hierarchy it's still activating. So some part of my system is still priming me to deal with a challenging situation. But, um, but other parts of the system, and I'd like to think sort of the lion's share of the rest of the system, sort of acknowledge that that's the case. It's now modeled that rise and fall in uncertainty. And so um, I'm, other parts of the system are no longer fussed. You might think it's the same thing that happens when people are gym rats. So you go to the gym regularly, at first, the first time you go to the gym and you get hurt, you think, this is awful. Who would want to do this? Like, I'm never going back. But you go long enough, and not only do you get acclimatized to the pain that you go through on legs day, but you start to like the pain. That means that one part of the system, you're still getting uncertainty signaling because the body expects to be whole, and now it's damaged, so you're getting, you're getting errors relative to the damage. But higher parts of the system that now expect the damage are able to reinterpret that error as a positive signal. Now it knows that when we get error at this level of the system, that actually means we're getting closer in the long run to getting to the thing that we highly expect, which is a super buff bod. So if you have a high expectation for a super buff bod, then it's good to have these little local errors every day because that's what you expect to have happen in order to reach your big expectation to have a super buff bod. You get that? Okay, you feel me? So now the local errors are contributing to a global un, uh, global certainty, which is why it's good, why it feels good. It can actually turn so, out to feel good. So the question is, do, do your top-down axioms, your big aim, your I want to be a bodybuilder, how much do the different levels of the system catch that like, and take that into account? Like if you decide you want to speak at event x and you know you're gonna to have to speak at little 50 smaller and smaller events getting bigger over time and on event 33 you're nervous how much does the top-down goal inform the different levels of the hierarchy the how much there i can't say because it'll be personality differences and context differences all of that but the more that you the more that you really care about something and the stronger your intentionality is to make that thing happen the more you're going to expect it to influence. Now, um, there are going to be low level, there's going to be low level mechanisms that work sort of regardless of agentive drives, right? So it doesn't matter if you want to be the world's best faster. Uh, the body still hurts from hunger. It doesn't matter what you want, really. Um, now, over time with training, can that be sort of adjusted and updated? Sure. But the more the more primitive and the more invariant those expectations, like expectations for food, water, social relationships, um, then the longer you're gonna need to update and adjust those predictions because they're really deep. You know, you're talking about deep brain, deep nervous system stuff, it's hard to budge. Can it be budged? Well, we have lots of examples where people do budge it, especially in monastic traditions, um, but uh, it's, it's sort of a long, hard road. So let me, let me bend back now to the project. So given that, given that horror movies might be valuable for mental health because one, they help close the informational gap over scary situations we might find ourselves in. And two, it lets us learn more about our own reactivity to scary stuff. And by learning more, 
we get better able to emotionally control in scary situations, okay? Then I just wanna supplant that and think about some of these contemplative training programs. So then why might it be valuable to reflect on the dying process? And I mean like in great detail. Why would you wanna start like by forwarding your imagination to the hospital bed and then very systematically through lots of lists, work through all the sorts of things that blow up and break down as you die. So first the body stops moving. Now you can't move your hands. Your hands are too heavy. Okay, now the blood in your veins starts slowing down. You can feel it slowing down. For the first time in your life, you can feel your blood coagulating, slowing down. And your eyes dry up now. Even the water in your eyes, that begins to dry up. Now your breath comes shorter. Now this is a super fast one I'm giving right now. But imagine you take hours to do this, okay? Now the water is drying up in your eyes. Now your breath is becoming ragged. Now your breath is slowing down. Now your breath is imperceptible. Now the breath falls out and your vision starts occluding, clouding, darkening. What if you worked through that program every day? Why would that be valuable? Because that is one of the training programs. That sounds, I think a lot of people are gonna feel that that's like a really scary thing to do. I think it's a totally natural response. Um, and yet it is a core program in contemplative training that we, um, that we have good reason to believe leads to good mental health rather than poor mental health. Well, the presumption is you are giving your systems enough of a taste of it. You are give, you are inserting the uncert the uncertainty. You are such that at the different levels of the hierarchy, especially the more superficial ones, you're starting to turn what that event means. So initially yeah. it meant chaos, but now yeah. if I'm more familiar with it, it means something that I'm used to. Yeah, good, right? So first one, close informational gap, I think is so interesting here. So um, I went through a bout at the end of my PhD. So anybody who's done a PhD will know it nearly kills you. It doesn't matter how good your experience is, but it's a really hard thing to do. You know, it's a lot of uncertainty to manage over, over a long period of time. And I started having some like anxiety nervous system bio behavioral stuff happen. Um, I felt mentally well, but my system was definitely under pressure. And a weird outcome of that was I started getting um, afraid of flying just out of nowhere. I flew my whole life. I've traveled lots. And suddenly I couldn't stomach, I couldn't stomach turbulence, like really bad, you know, where I'm sick to my stomach every 10 minutes on the flight or something like it's real, real bad. And you know what worked? You know what actually made it better? This is really interesting. I started practicing every day, like a formal meditative practice. I would imagine over and over and over again for blocks of time every day, driving to the airport, waiting in line, getting on the flight, the flight taking off, there being turbulence. And then I always imagine sometimes it's steady, sometimes it's really turbulent. Of course, then it becomes steady again, and then it's really turbulent, then it's steady again. And then the flight comes down, turbulence on the way down, land safely, I get out, get in a cab, get to my destination, start again. And I just did that over and over and over and over again. And I didn't feel like I got any particular insight on the mat. It's not like on the mat, I suddenly was like, oh, wow, it's just like that. Look, sometimes there's turbulence, sometimes there's not. Oh, I've, I've got it. Now I can relax. It wasn't like that at all. It really did just feel like work, like meditative work. And yet, almost in no time, I'm flying again now with ease, sleeping the whole flight. Um, so anecdotally, what I think actually took place there was my system was bucking because it was suddenly very sensitive to a kind of uncertainty that happens when you fly. And in order to help my system better manage that uncertainty, I imaginatively, so this is a content discussion about meditation, I worked through that process enough that enough of the subsystems in me got a handle on what the, what the program was gonna be like. And so then it moved from uncertain uncertainty to certain uncertainty. I was sure there's going to be turbulence and yet it's manageable turbulence. It always comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes and I land, yeah? Okay, so here's the question then, and it's a great pivot. What's the practical edge here and how can listeners do that same exercise really in the various areas of their life where this comes up. 
Yeah, well, I think death is such a good one. I mean, if we want to take a, a nip of the hard stuff. Um, uh, ideally, in a, in a training program like this, you might start with the easy stuff like having a cold. Um, maybe we can just start there. Like practically, this is a good place to start, actually, is meditatively. And all I mean by meditatively is, is in a like in a sort of pure or in a comprehensive way, like sit and think about what it is to get a cold. And then look around at all the examples of people getting colds that you've seen. So I just want you to remember all the times you've seen like sniffly noses and watery eyes and bit hacky coughs and little bit temperature and missing events and a bit, bit sweaty and like, just like just ordinary cold stuff. And then you can, you can ask yourself, is this a, is this a natural or an unnatural state that can help? Is this a natural and unnatural state being sick? And I mean, just for you, Jamie, like when you think about that and then, I mean, what's the, what's the automatic, what's the automatic natural response? It's a bit of a relief because at the, the moment you ask that question, you go, oh, well, it's natural and then your resistance to it drops a touch. Right there. Okay. So then it becomes certain uncertainty. So let, let's push it a little bit further. Why is it natural? Why is it natural to get a cold? Why is it natural to get sick? Why is that the case? It's your body's mechanism of recovering, actually, because the symptoms you often find are your body's response. Like a blocked nose, like I've got now, right. is your body fighting it, not right. it. Right, good. And why, why would something like us get sick? I mean, what's the root cause? The, oh God, good question. The complexity of being a living thing. Yeah, right. Okay, there. Right, right, right. Exactly. Like you are, you are like an, you are like a, a miraculously complex biosystem, and uh, it is just the case that for miraculously complex biosystems in our kind of niche, uh, sickness is just one of the things that occurs. It's just like part of the complexity of the system, and like more than that, you know, really we're living in a biosphere that's primarily dominated by single cell organisms. Like single cell organisms are make up by far the most biomass on the planet earth. So it's not like, it's not like it's the human earth with some viruses. This is the virus earth with some yeah. humans. Okay. Yeah. So it's not surprising that we get sick. Like it's not a surprising thing that we get sick and even get very sick. Um, it would be, it would be very, very surprising that that doesn't happen because it's very rote. It's very normal and natural here. So working through imaginatively, the process of getting sick and at the same time allowing yourself to acknowledge that that process is really, really ordinary. That's really, really, it's not, it doesn't count as an uncertain state. Yes. The body has like local uncertainties, but actually this isn't an uncertain state at all. Now, if you never really do that, if you don't really encounter enough sickness, then it will always be a little bit surprising, which means the system will always buck the uncertainty because it doesn't really know just like the anxiety um uh scale if you don't get enough anxieties up and downs then you never really learn that it's okay to have a little bit of anxiety because it always goes down it, my wife has like a monster immune system she's rarely been sick in her whole life so if she gets a cold she becomes the biggest baby it's like she's dying it's like it's like like it's that kind of a drama you know, it is really a terrible, horrible, unmanageable thing to have a cold. I, on the other hand, who was born basically having an asthma attack, have been in and out of the hospital so many times that if I get a cold, I'm like, yes, it's a day of watching TV on the couch where I don't have to do any work and I have a perfectly good reason not to do that. I enjoy days where I get sick. That's the difference between two predictive systems, one in which it's uncertain uncertainty and the other in which I've gotten enough data points that it's now certain uncertainty. Unfortunately, wait, fortunately, we can get that usually for sickness, but we can also help it along contemplatively. We can start looking and thinking through the program of getting sick. We could think through the program of getting injured. We could think through the program of getting old. Now, getting old and dying are special here, because those ones you don't get a lot of examples for. You only sort of get old once, although I guess you get the little old things along the way, but you definitely only die once. Um, you know, if you're very lucky, maybe you have a couple near death, I don't lucky or unlucky, I'm not sure. You get some near death experiences to trial the whole process 
out. Um, and actually, interestingly, people who have near-death experiences often lose a lot of their fear of death as if they've now gained some evidence for what it's like. And as soon as it's certain uncertainty, um, they become better able to manage and digest and approach and um, so relate little, to this terrible so in other uncertainty. Words, so in other words, there are some things if you get ill semi-regularly, you'll just bump into and get your information gap closed just through life. Right. But there's others like dying where you have to help yourself along. Right, right, right. Where you could help yourself along. And lo and behold, we have training programs that are built just to do that. So um, uh, a traditional death meditation um, that I've done for a number of years, very easy one that we could just share here in case anybody's interested in trialing it. Uh, it's very interesting. It's three questions. That's it. You just sit and you close your eyes and you think through these three questions and you answer them honestly, as honestly as you can. Okay. The first question is, will you die? And the answer has to come back. Yes. And you just hang out. You hang out with the reaction. You use your contemplative training that you have so far so that you can just stay cool. And you just ask yourself a few times just so that you can help the system turn towards, start turning towards something that is true, not morbid, but just true. Will I die? Yes. When will I die? And the answer is you can't know. It's impossible to know. Really, any time is, uh, is acceptable for death. Yeah, very young people die, medium-aged people die, very, very old people die. Um, it comes when it comes. There's no way you can know. And you sit with that and you let the system sort of update relative to that truth. And the last one is you mentally project yourself to the end and you watch those last moments of life from the inside. And just at the turning point, you stop and you ask yourself, what will have mattered in this life at this moment? So you're way up on this high wall of death and you're looking back over the topography of your life and you ask yourself, what, what will have mattered? Um, and uh, a lot of wisdom, a lot of wisdom can be garnered from that high point. Just what's your intuition, Jamie? Even just sort of like, I you know, just closed your eyes here just for a second. What's your intuition there? What will have really matter at the last sort of turn? The thing that jumps out at me intuitively is like, did I spend time doing stuff I liked doing and wanted to yeah, do? Yeah, right. And the stuff that seems less relevant, and I know this sounds like a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, Yeah, is all the pernickety insecurities you have of what people might think about the activity yeah. or the thing. What will that matter at the end? What would it matter? What would that have possibly mattered? That somebody thought your like obsession with skiing was silly. Like, who, who, what does that matter? That wouldn't matter at, at all, right? Uh, but would your mortgage matter or your your no. debt, to, debt to wealth ratio or how many Ferraris you've owned? Like, I, mean, I, I don't no. know if those things would really matter. What about, what about time with family or um, the amount of like love you've experienced or that you've had real connections that were meaningful? And that's what people come back with usually from this high edge is they come back with, wow, my family mattered, my friends mattered. Being a good person sounds like it might matter, like doing something good for the world so that you can leave it a little bit better than when you got here, that stuff turns out to really be the meaningful stuff. Now there's such an interesting thing. We're turning towards something really challenging, but by doing it, we're learning something about how our lives should be structured. And that's the radical gift. That's the radical gift of meditating on this radical uncertainty is that you come back to learning how to manage day-to-day -day volatility in new and better, more insightful, more wise, more compassionate ways. And what a wonderful thing that rather than evading the uncertainty and continuing to act in unskillful ways, we step into the uncertainty and it makes us more certain about how to live. It's just a wonderful paradox. It's not paradoxical. It's just a wonderful happenstance. And it's something that I'd really like to um, put in the lab and, and show that it's the case too. Mark, that was really cool, mate. Great. <laughs> Oh, guys, this has been the Contemplative Science Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. This has been one of those pods where I need to now go away and try and implement some of this stuff. Uh, Mark, thank you for that, mate. And everyone at home, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. <laughs>